uh, traveling all the way down to Toronto's East End to sit in this geometric Scandinavian cafe with us. Yeah, it's great to be back. Actually, I lived in the East End while doing my PhD, so it's nice to see the neighborhood and everything that's changed. And, you know, you were here in your, doing your PhD, 2004 or 2009, I think. That's right. You were yeah. in Jeff's lab, Jeff Hinton. And what was it like to be doing research, your PhD research in this area with Jeff Hinton at the time just before the explosion? It was a wonderful place to be in between those years, 2004 to 2009, because a lot of the fundamental discoveries in the deep learning field were made. And a lot of the students in the lab at the time who were making these discoveries have gone on to lead some of the major AI research labs, both in industry and academia. So was there a sense back then that you were getting really close to something big? There was a sense, but it was within the group. There was a lot of excitement. We knew we were working on the right thing. Uh, I don't think we had an idea how big it, it would really get. People like Joshua and, and Jeff have been working on deep learning and believing in it for much longer. Are there any techniques from pre-2012 that might yield promising results today given enough data, compute, and hyperparameter tuning? So I think there's a lot of value still in going back to these old NIPS papers from the early 80s and, and, and 90s and, and revisiting them in the context of where the field has, has gone now. One uh, technique in particular that seems to have a resurgence recently, particularly in the natural language processing field, is pre-training strategy. So pre-training is the idea of essentially uh, initializing a network by using another type of uh, learning. And so you might use unsupervised learning to learn features and then perform a secondary learning process like supervised learning to train the model towards a particular task. And uh, this is something that we were actually doing back when I was doing my PhD. It really kicked off deep learning and people got very excited that they, could be, they were able to train deeper networks using these kinds of pre-training -tra strategies. And then in the years that followed that, uh, they fell out of favor a little bit. Um, but this is something that has picked up again, uh, as I said, in natural language processing where people are learning uh, various embeddings or fine-tuning task-specific networks. So this is an example of sort of going back a few years, revisiting something and, and, and it working better in, in the context of, of today's deep learning. The last thing I'd want to say is with all the advent of meta-learning and, and automatic machine learning and so forth, we might actually discover some of the ideas or rediscover some of the ideas that were already proposed in the 80s and 90s because we're actually allowing these systems to learn themselves, actually learn learning algorithms. So I wouldn't be surprised if we discover some of these old techniques and these old strategies. What tools and techniques do we need to adopt in order to really benefit from the so-called software 2.0 paradigm? I think right now we are spending a lot of time uh, tweaking what we would call hyperparameters. So these are all the sorts of knobs associated with making a machine learning system better. S some of these new strategies um, in the field of um, meta-learning and, and, and meta-optimization allows us to do is actually do a more systematic procedure to search over this space of parameters. So if we're willing to sort of give up the control over some of these systems and realize that machines are much better at searching high dimensional space than humans, we can sort of let go and allow these algorithms to, to sort of tune themselves and get better. So I think it's, it's, it's certainly important that we, we follow this, this literature, try out the new the frameworks that are proposed, and again, just sort of uh, give in to the algorithm uh, while doing the things that we always do, which is which visualize, uh, debug, build standard workflows, the, all the good things that you want to say a, a graduate student or a researcher to do. Are we there yet? So this is a classic question, always coming from the back seat. And really, we need to understand what is this word there, right? What does it mean to be there? And a lot of people look at it being AGI or artificial general intelligence, making machines that are basically indistinguishable from humans. It's super difficult to even define intelligence. We could debate on it for a long time. I was at a recent um, uh, brain symposium hosted by CIFAR and we spent like nearly half a day debating over consciousness and what it meant to be conscious. So these things like consciousness and intelligence, they're, they're concepts that can be debated and they're very difficult to measure. And those things that we, we can't really measure, we, we, we don't know if we've actually arrived there. And it also makes it difficult to sort of optimize these systems towards things like intelligence if we can't measure them. To what extent has a lack of sort of commonly held rigorous evaluation metrics um, really inhibited growth in the field? 
So on one side, having really commonly accepted metrics that are precise and really well-defined and, and, and matching what we, we want to see in a task haven't really hindered certain um, applications from being developed. I'd like to point to the natural language field. I mean, we have fairly weak metrics still in evaluating the output of generative models of text, but we've still been able to build amazing applications in machine translation and, and, and parsing and dialogue systems and How so forth. How does that happen? Well, I mean, we can make a lot of approximations in these models. Like another example is these neural nets are extremely robust to noise. We can have noise in the labels and we can still learn. So just like we as humans, our brains are, are really robust to noise, these systems are robust to noise. Whether that noise is in the input data or the, the evaluation metrics aren't quite correct or the, the metric by which we, we learn the, these models is not quite, quite correct. So it hasn't stopped us, but certainly we need to work on better ways of quantifying these systems because there's a lot of people that are looking at the field and, and, and sort of saying it's, it's extremely empirical right now. We don't understand a lot of times what's going on. And it also allows us to close the loop on fully automated learning to learn, right? If we want to actually close this loop, have systems get better, we need to be able to judge their output in an automated way. How do you see optimization-based search influencing engineering design? We learn to be sort of the ones in, in charge and be the boss and think that we're the, the ones that are the, always designing the system. It's a, a little bit about letting go and realizing that algorithms are much better at searching high dimensional search spaces than humans. So first of all, we've got to propose these design problems in the, in the form of a search. So we have to actually design a, a, a space of designs and then we have to have a good optimization algorithm to search that. I was actually at a, a, a architecture conference called Smart Geometry in May and the whole topic of this conference was machine minds and I saw architects and industrial designers who were really keen on machine learning and AI for actually making buildings or designing objects like one. Someone talking about designing better shoes using mm -hmm. algorithms. Actually, I, I used to think the company was Adidas, but he said it was Adidas. That's how he proposed it. But they had a facility in, in Europe that was actually uh, able to um, use algorithms to produce a shoe and then have a, a way of measuring its performance um, using robots that tested the shoe. In the way that you've seen these videos, maybe from Ikea that you know builds a cabinet and opens it a million times. <laughs> but it was essentially like a, a, a instrumenting a facility where shoes could be tested by robots. Hmm. And those were really fed back into the loop and, and made better. As a generalist though, how much do you need to know in order to be able to provide tools for people that are going to help them move into the next era? Well, I think it's difficult to become a deep domain expert in all these specific areas because we can touch on so many things with, with deep learning, again, being a general purpose technology. Now, we have to be able to understand enough of the problem to be able to cast it in a, in, in a machine learning framework. And so we can also employ people to help us too. So we have the, the researchers, we have the people on the particular, let's say the, the business problem or the, the, the scientific problem that needs to be solved. But then we can have what's called a, say a business translator or, or data, data analysis that can sort of sit between us and understand both sides. They understand the technical side, but they really understand the problem. And so I think more people that we can bring into our circles that can assist us with that, um, it is really valuable being able to touch a number of areas. I think we also have to, to pick and choose a bit in terms of our collaborations. And, and I think people are really enthusiastic about um, machine learning, deep learning, AI, and so forth. But not air, all areas are ready yet for, for exploitation. It all, again, it all comes down to the, the data and being able to collect data from these various domains. And we have to understand the, the, the scientific problem or the business to be able to really yield a picture of how we should be actually collecting the data, what's the right data to collect. Um, and in some cases, that's really difficult. In your experience, which areas have you found are the most ripe for augmentation? So right now, I think we, we work on deep learning specifically, so this matches problems where the data is very high dimensional, it's unstructured, so it's things like videos and images and audio signals. Um, this is the best fit for deep learning. There's other types of data that's more structured that might not be a, a, a great fit. So again, having knowledge of deep learning and being specialists in that area, we tend to gravitate toward these problems that are say, picked up by sensors. Graham, thank you. Thanks a lot for hosting me here, and this is. Pretty, pretty cool venue, and uh, it's, it's been my pleasure. Excellent, thank you so much for coming.